Good day and welcome to FinChat Podcast, where we interview professionals in the finance industry to allow them to share their experiences and knowledge to educate and expose the next generation of business people and entrepreneurs to the world of finance, banking and related topics. My name is Randy Setter and here at FinChat we recognize experience in business as a resource to learn from and we try to harness that resource as best as possible. Good day and welcome back to the FinChat Podcast. We're back on the second iteration of the credit series. Today we dive into credit, but more in a personal finance perspective. If you missed the first episode, we'd encourage you to go back and give it a listen as it sets the scene for this episode. Kwasi, welcome back to the FinChat Podcast. How are you? Thank you for having me, Randy. I'm doing very well, thank you. How are you? I'm really good. So in the podcast, we mentioned your current role as a credit analyst at RMB. So just to, I guess, set the scene and have a launching pad for this conversation. Can we go into like a basic overview on credit and how it's used? And yeah, let's just start there. Right. Um, Good. So think about you giving money to someone. Now, when you give that money to someone, um, it is um, you're hoping that you receive that money back. But at the point where money has left your bank account, you are now exposed to credit risk. That means the risk that you will not be repaid for whatever reason. Um, And so the role of the credit analyst is basically to do detailed analysis to identify the probability that you will not be paid. And in the event that um, you are not, in the event that there is default, what is the percentage that you can potentially um, recover? And so that's what credit is um, basically about. Um, what usually comes along with that, um, good credit, bad credit. So could we go into that? You know, what is good credit? What is bad credit? Right. Um, would you like to, me to talk about it from a personal perspective? Yes, from a personal, yeah, from a personal right. perspective. So individual. So perhaps let me, let me use an illustration to pick up the point. Suppose someone invites you, a company invites you to invest in their business. And when you ask them for an investment pitch, i.e. what is the investment proposal? What's the value proposal of this business? The pitch goes along something like this. We are going to take your money and we are going to invest the money in um, private jets for the company. Mind you, this is a manufacturing company. Um, or retail business, we're going to purchase private jets. We're going to pay huge bonuses um, to our uh, our directors and employees. Um, we are going to buy new cars um, so that we can arrive at events in style. Then you ask yourself, would you invest in this business? Is your investment going to be used wisely to generate a return? Any rational investor will realize that their money is being poured down the drain and the chances of it being recovered, very slim. The money is not being deployed um, economically, but rather is to create a facade, um, an image that people can buy into. But behind that image, there is no real economic substance. And so with that principle in mind, we need to look at how we um, take out um, personal finance, financing or loans for ourselves. Um, Are you taking out a loan in order to create a certain image, to build a certain image of yourself? Or is this loan going to support the creation of value to build Um, your financial strength in the long run. So bad credit goes towards funding a certain lifestyle, funding a certain image so that people can look at you or elevate you just based on what they see. But good credit will be used to generate wealth in the long run. So if you're taking out credit for education, that's upskilling yourself, that will um, hopefully land you a better job, will allow you to negotiate a better salary, that's good credit. 
if you're taking credit to purchase a house, obviously the credit, you must be able to afford it. In my view, that's good credit. Why? Because the house will grow in value, right? But if the credit is to buy a fancy car, then know that that car is a depreciating asset. It will not give you credit. Most people are mistaken to think that other people want to be associated with people who look um, um, sort of successful. And so they focus on the look and that's why they go and buy the expensive um, car and the expensive clothes. The problem is when people start digging and trying to find out your substance, you will have nothing to present to them. And then you will lose their respect and that image will mean very little. And so you would have wasted whatever credit um, you incurred in order to support that image. So rather focus on credit, which will generate wealth on a sustainable basis. Now for young professionals, um, I got numerous questions um, over the lockdown period and prior to that, but what a credit score is. So do you mind if we just unpack that? Right. So a credit score is basically, let's call it, um, is a, rep a re representation of how good a credit a debtor you are, rather. Um, it is actually measuring the probability of default. So the probability of default is the probability that you will not pay your debts um, when they are due, right? And so the credit score um, captures that. So if I can use sort of um, global credit rating agencies, um, they've got um, a whole list ranging from uh, triple A plus um, going down to triple C. Triple C means you're already in uh, um, close to default. I think D means you've, you've defaulted, right? Um, as you move towards a triple A, it means the chances of you defaulting are close to zero. The probability close to zero. I think it's a probably um, between a one and 3% chance that you will default. But triple C, the chances of you defaulting, very, very high. And anyone who is extending credit to you would be um, very afraid unless they've got a huge risk appetite, then they'll lend to you, but they will also want um, a return, which is commensurate. And so you charge a higher um, return um, or interest rate to poor credit um, um, score individuals. Um, so the credit score basically captures your ability to honor, um, your ability and willingness to honor any credit that has been extended to you. Well, then how do I go about improving my credit score um, if I'm a student or a young professional just starting out? Right. Um, the truth of the matter is most people um, will encourage you, you know, go and take um, out a, a clothing account, um, so on and so forth. And I think that's actually quite um, bad. The main reason is it's very easy to now incur debt just to create a certain image the moment you have a clothing account. So yes, while you're building um, some kind of a, a credit record, uh, the risk is that you will not be disciplined to use those accounts um, in the most effective way. So I generally say, do not take those accounts. Rather fund your, um, your necessary expenditure within the confines of your, of your income, all right? Your first major credit um, that you're going to incur is going to probably be your car. And you need to make sure that you purchase a car that you can service um, and at the same time, um, you'll be able to live a comfortable lifestyle, but make sure that you do not default on any payment on that vehicle. Because even if you delay payment by a single day, it goes against you. Most people don't know this. It goes against you. So if um, the debit order is meant to go off on the 25th and on the 25th, there's no money, but money arrives on the 26th, that goes against you big time. So what you want to do is you want to make sure that there's always funds. If you can, try and add an additional layer to the repayment of your, of, of, of your vehicle, i.e. if you have to pay a thousand rands every single month, probably pay a thousand one hundred. And that one hundred 
actually goes um, in your favor in terms of your credit score. It highlights your commitment to go the extra mile to settle um, your debts, All right? Um, so that I think is a good starting platform to build your credit score. Um, if you feel as though you're extremely disciplined, um, then yes, you can start building the credit score, um, taking out a clothing account. But the issue is there are clothing accounts available for students and um, some students really abuse that system um, and they don't realize how it comes back um, to bite them in the long run. Um, what other additional factors then would you um, consider in terms of vehicle financing? Um, let me just set the scene there is, okay, next year I'll be walking into corporate. So what key considerations would I need to be looking for in the first car, financing it, also making sure obviously that my repayments are on time so it doesn't go against my credits. Yeah. Right. So I think um, first and foremost, you need to assess your need for a, for a car. Okay. Consider um, um, where your employer is going to be and the nature of the work that you're going to do. All right. Once you've established that, identify how far you will need to travel on a monthly basis. So suppose you're working in in, in Santon um, and you're working with one of the banks. Um, once you're in the office, you don't need to move um, around, right? Um, yeah. Then consider how far away from work you, you live, okay? And how accessible public transport is and how efficient public transport is. So for instance, if you live in an area where the only available public transport are buses and taxis, you probably want to get a car because buses and taxis might not be as reliable. Um, but if you live in a place where you have access to the Hau train, I'm using Johannesburg mm -hmm. as, a, as, a, as, a, as a base, then there's no need for a car because the Hau train is relatively efficient and it's quite quick and it will get you to your destination in time. So you just need to plan um, you know, your, your logistics a bit and make sure that um, you arrive at work on time every single day. Now, let's assume that you have assessed the need for a vehicle, okay? Yes. Yes. The first thing you need to do is establish a budget, okay? So you get this salary and notice when you start, um, your salary is peanuts. Um, so don't be quite ambitious yeah. as to the, you know, the kind of car you're going to get. <laughs> um, so you have a salary, <clears throat> deduct, the main expenses. These are the most important expenses. Okay. And when I say important, I mean rent, having a roof over your head, very critical. Food, having a reasonable amount, okay, available um, for food. Okay. Um, now, some people might have to send some money home. That is fine. Include it in your, in your budget. Include whatever you consider to be important. So it might be important for you to list. Um, in order of priority, the expenses you have. Then of what is left, okay? Suppose you say, okay, I have 2000 left, okay? Go and prepare an amortization schedule or use your knowledge of present value, um, of yeah, present value um, finance and determine the maximum present value of those future um, of future cash flow. So 2,000 rands paid on a monthly basis for the next 60 months at a given interest rate. Determine what the present value is, okay? Perhaps put a layer. So if, if you have 2,000, maybe add 2,100 um, to make sure that you're comfortably able to serve um, um, service such a loan. The value you get, okay? That should be the limit in terms of your budget for finding a car. And then you go out and find a car that meets that amount. So it means that um, you will be able to finance this car. Um, and, um, and so the car will fit, you know, appropriately within um, your budget. And that has been the way that I've always gone about um, purchasing vehicles. And I think it's a, it's a good discipline to have as a, a, a person entering the working world for the first time. I'm definitely going to do my more to this. <laughs> That's good. Um, now, you spoke about the budget, you know, you spoke about rent. So now, I'm actually 
putting 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 my shoes on mm-hmm. there. And okay, next year, going in, let's say I'm considering moving out. Right. Um, currently I have the privilege of being at home during this lockdown period. Um, so let's say I'm considering moving out. Um, now I'm evaluating because I was actually thinking a friend of mine uh, invested in a property, you mm-hmm. know, and and moved into that property to to avoid um, the rental obligation each right. month. You know, but of now he has mortgage repayments. Um, so renting versus owning a property, uh, could you take me through like what what factors you'd look at as a young professional? So let's say, yeah, let's talk about that. Right. Um, I think. Firstly, is affordability. So um, I, I go through the same discipline as I would consider purchasing a car. Um, I look at my finances. I look at the rent. So I'll take the rent, okay, and I'll do some kind of amortization schedule, right, to decide what value of, of property I should be looking at, which areas will I be able to access such property, okay? Um, because at the end of the day, the rent you're paying the present value might be quite small that the property um, you can access is, um, is, is not in a desirable place. Mm-hmm. So that is important. Is the property that you're looking at in a desirable place so that its value is going to um, rise and add to your wealth? If, it's, if it doesn't meet that criteria, it's better to rent. One thing that many people don't take into account are the additional cost of owning property. So there are levies that you have to pay if you're going to buy um, purchase an apartment. Um, there are rates that you have to pay, but over and above that, there are certain cash outflows that you have to incur when you start. So bond registration costs, okay? That's a cost you need to, you need to consider. Those costs, depending on the bank that you're dealing with, can be capitalized into the loan. But if the bank doesn't agree, that is a cash outflow that you have to prepare for. There's transfer duties, okay? Now we know that um, if you purchase any property a million and below, um, you don't have to pay any transfer duties, um, but any amount above a million, you have to pay um, transfer duties and you need to budget um, for that. So that's a a huge um, initial outflow that people need to um, budget for, okay? So there are these costs that one needs to consider um, over and above just servicing um, the debt and they need to put it together and see whether they'll be able to um, um, what maintain the property and the costs um, of the bond. Now, I have a couple of questions from students. Um, so I'm just going to pose them to you and we'll, we'll discuss it. Sure. Right. So what are the common mistakes that either you've done personally or have seen other young professionals done when they first start using credit? Ah, right. Sure. I think the first mistake is, um, I think the idea, with, when you get credit, it is, the mis- first mistake is you assume that it validates you as a person. Now, I- I'll unpack what it means by, what I mean by validate. You feel as though you have arrived. You feel as though you are successful. Okay. And so you yeah. go out yeah. into a, in what you when you go out you want to show people that you're successful you know so for instance when your credit card depending on which bank um you get it from other people can recognize the value of that credit card okay so even when you flash it out it raises eyebrows and people immediately yes. start to it's look it. at you differently they start to give you you know respect obviously when they give that when they look at you in that way you want to prove that there's real substance behind it, okay? And so your hands will be that action that continue to swipe. So you start eating, you know, um, expensive um, um, food. You start going out um, regularly. Um, You start purchasing expensive clothes. um, And that's the mistake. Before you know it, you've used up, you know, the full limit of that credit card. um, And there's no space. And the repayment becomes expensive. Um, And now you have to cut back on your essential um, sort of expenditures in order to service the credit card. So I think that's one of the biggest um, sort of mistakes. And certainly I've made that mistake in the younger years of my career. (laughs) 
That's actually a word I was looking for today. I describe you as a seasoned professional. <laughs> That's the word for today. <laughs> so, um, so what I'm getting is it's a, the status yep. game, you know, the, and this has come about um, multiple you know, conversations I've had with people that we currently play all the time. So um, what I've learned from this is, is, you know, avoid the status game as much as you can and you, your credit score will do, will do You're right. great. Absolutely. Okay. So um, another one, okay, now this one here is a bit interesting. So, okay, so why is credit so important in our, our scenario? And you can just critique this if it's incorrect, right? So someone asked, okay, listen, if I have 1 million in my bank account, mm -hmm. right, but I don't use any credit, right, would I still be eligible for a mortgage based on the, the million rand I have in my bank account? Oh, most definitely. There's nothing more that um, right. banks love than um, security. You being able to put you know, liquid security right. up front. So the more liquid the security is, the lower the bank's risk. Because Im Im imagine this. So assume that you go for 1 million a house, rent house, okay? And you have got um, investments listed on the JSE um, to the value of 1 million rand. And you pledge that, um, that pool of assets, okay? Um, to the bank as security that they can liquidate it in the event that you're not able to pay for your, um, your, your property, okay? When the bank looks at it, okay, they'll say, okay, we can actually sell these assets relatively quickly, okay? As opposed to if you said, no, here's a car I'm pledging as security, the haircut on the value of the car is deep. So if that car is worth 100,000, they probably can, uh, will be able to salvage 50,000. But if it's listed investments, okay, or cash, okay, they are very liquid, easy for them to um, convert that cash flow and pay for the loan. And so what that does is they perceive you as very low risk and it, it then translates into a lower interest rate for you. So what you do is you get away by paying lower interest rates, which becomes much more valuable for you. Okay, so the students said that it kind of feels like the system is mm. making you take credit. And if you don't take credit, right. then you can't have certain things, mm. right? So if you don't have a good credit score, then you can't take a, a mortgage. But the only way to get a good, a good credit score is by taking credit. Therefore, the system is promoting okay, debt. So, is that right? So let's... Hmm, it's a very contentious <laughs> um, issue. Is the system promoting um, <laughs> debt? They are certainly trying to promote good debt, um, from what I understand. The main reason is there's huge risk that um, the system faces if the debt that they extend, uh, they extend is, uh, is bad. Um, but what the system uses against you is your emotional bias. So that bit, I, I would say, is quite true. Your emotional bias. Uh, bias. You, when I say emotional bias, I'm still talking about that status thing. The system knows you want to look good. You want to be seen in certain places. You want to be seen in a certain car. You want to be known to be living in a certain area. And they know that very well. And they know that um, the only way you can afford it is through debt. Okay. So the system, and, and don't mistake in the system, um, because the system has got access to a lot of your information. They can profile you. They know you much better than you know yourself. Yeah, you would actually be surprised. So all those posts on Facebook and all of that stuff, you can synthesize that into who you are, what is your behavior, where in your, your the life cycle are you? And based on that, they can target you, okay? And offer you certain, um, certain loans. It is up to you to decide whether you're going to accept or you're not going to accept. So think about a guy trying to woo a lady. Okay, you basically go out, you mac, you put forward a proposal, and if she accepts, it's game. If she doesn't, then the, you know um, <laughs> the deal is off. And it's exactly the same thing. So it's not that the system is is rigged in itself; is that they know your your core desires and they're trying to entice you to take out um, the debt. The point is one, are you going to take out the credit? And two, if you do take the credit, are you going to behave responsibly? Okay, obviously the system wants people to behave responsibly. The more responsible you are, 
the better the credit quality of their loan book, the greater the value that they are able to generate um, for their shareholders. Now, in terms of um, funding people who have got poor credit scores, remember what they do is they play a game of averages. So just because you are a bad um, sort of debtor um, doesn't mean the next person who has got a poor credit score is going to default on the loan. So if I take a risk on one person, let's say I have 100,000 and I give that 100,000 to uh, uh, someone who's got a really poor credit score, the chances of me losing that 100,000 is very huge. But if I take that 100,000 and I spread it across 100 people who have got poor credit scores, the chances of me recovering my 100,000 is now much, much higher, all right? Um, so it's yeah. not that I'm rigging the system trying to force yeah. you to get debt, but I understand um, the risk-taking game much better um, than you do, all right? So, so to go back to the key um, issue, are they, is it a catch-22, i.e. they're trying to force you to get debt um, so that you can get a good credit score? My answer is you don't need a good credit score in order to get debt. What you need to realize is you, the worse your credit score is, the higher the interest you're going to, you're going to pay. Okay, but all they're doing is to say, let's yeah. whet this person's appetite based on what we know and understand of them and see if they're going to buy it. Okay, very insightful. And now, lastly, a more practical level is, now, with credit scores, where, where can people find this information? So if I want to look up my credit score, calculate my credit score, is there any way I could do this? Or do I have to go through my bank, ask what my credit score is? Because you spoke about, you know, the, the system, and I'm not necessarily saying a bank, uh, but the system kind of having more information about you than you know about yourself. So right. is there so, um, to access this information? <clears throat> Note that banks are not in the business of giving credit scores. Um, so the bank will have their own proprietary approach to issuing credit scores, which they'll never um, share with their, um, with their, with their clients. Um, but every sort of um, credit deal which you enter needs to be registered in a central, I think, um, um, database. Um, and from it, people can, um, can assess your, 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 your credit um, sort of quality. So there are a couple of entities that provide it. I think TransUnion um, is one of those. So if you go to transunion.coza, you can access your credit score. Um, I haven't really tried to identify other providers of, of credit scores, but um, I know there are a couple in the market. That concludes it with second episode. Pleasure. Thank, thank you so much, Kwasi, for coming on the episode today. And to all our listeners, thank you for listening to the podcast. Tune in next time. And if you like the podcast, give us a favorable rating on your podcast platform. Remember to share it with your friends so we can all learn something new. We post reports on the conversations we have in podcasts and other related topics so on LinkedIn, so follow us. You can also find us on IG and Twitter, where we post bite-sized infographics. 